you all here. You ready to worship the Lord this morning? Amen.
time began You were on your throne You are God alone Right now In the good times and bad You are on your throne You are God alone You are God alone From the fourth time
justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but he finally said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord says, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? There's a lot going on in this passage. A lot of characters to think through. And it's a really short little passage. What do we know about the judge in this parable? We know a couple of things. First, it says he doesn't fear God. He doesn't respect people. He doesn't care about people at all. And we know that this is important because in this short little tiny couple of first parable, that's stressed two different times. And he even says it about himself. I don't fear God and I don't care about people. He doesn't fear God. He doesn't care about people. He doesn't know God. That's what this means. He doesn't care about God. He doesn't have a relationship with God. He doesn't know God's laws. He's in charge. He's doing things his own way. 
running his court, running his life however he wants, he did not fear God at all. And how do we know? Because if he's really a judge, he's really using God's justice. You know, in Deuteronomy 27, cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And this woman in this case is a widow. He's just perverting justice. He doesn't care. I, I just go away. You're driving me crazy. But secondly, we know not only does he not fear God, he doesn't care about people. So what does this mean? Not only does he not respect what God tells him to do, he doesn't care what you think either. <laughs> he doesn't care about people at all. He treats people poorly because he's in charge and he doesn't care what anyone thinks. He doesn't answer anybody. And if we need evidence of this, it's how in this short little story we realize he's been rejecting this widow for a long time. So that's the judge. What do we know about the widow? Also, not a whole lot. We know that what the Bible tells us about widows, and especially in that culture, you can imagine what a struggle it would be um, to fend for yourself, to be defenseless in a culture that's so male-dominated and so dependent on men running things. You would be just helpless, especially in a case like this with a court. Um, so I think it goes without saying that she's really vulnerable. She is without protection. She has no one to speak for her, no one to defend her, and no one to stand up for her. In verse 3, we see that she is seeking justice from her enemies, what it says. And we don't know all the details about that either, because this is a parable. But you can imagine that someone in some way in a dispute is harming her, or taking something from her, and there's some kind of injustice going on. Mm -hmm. But the one thing we know without the shadow of a doubt with this woman is that she's persistent, right? right. Yep. Persistent. Mm -hmm. You can just imagine that one day she shows up at court, and she signs in, and she's on the docket for the day, and she waits in this line, and he hears all these trials, and then she gets her appearance before the judge. It's, this is ridiculous. No, case dismissed. I don't have time for this. But she's not deterred. She comes back the next day, gets in line, repeats the process, waits, gets her name on the docket, Finally gets her turn after waiting. You were just here yesterday. What? What? No, this case is meaningless. I don't have time for this. this case this means get out. Mm -hmm. Repeat, third verse, second time. <laughs> Same thing. She shows up again. She's just not going to let it go. There's an injustice being done to me. She waits all day in line. Her name's on the docket at the courthouse, and she shows up. Finally gets her appearance in front of the judge. Go away. You're just like a little flea. You're driving me crazy. Your case means nothing. I'm settling gigantic cases all day long. When you come to me with your little injustice, I don't respect you. I don't fear God. I don't care about you. I don't care about people at all. Go away. And she leaves. And then she comes again one more time, waits in line, puts her name on the docket, Finally gets your parents for the court. My, my life's in danger. I need protection. No one is here to protect me. Do you not get it? There is nobody here to stand up for me. I don't have an attorney. I don't have a husband. I don't have a father. I don't have a son. I am alone, and I'm defenseless, and I need help. You're driving me crazy to judge this. The widow's not discouraged. She never gives up. She comes back again and again. And again. What's interesting, I think, in this story, in a lot of stories, it's helpful to take out a couple of versions and translations. And I know that's it's not hard today with technology. You can just kind of click a button and look at New Living and NIV and RSV, whatever you want to look at. So it's kind of neat to get different takes on what this judge is actually saying because he says in some versions, because this widow keeps bothering me, I'm going to do this so she doesn't beat me down. That's what he says. This mighty judge is worried about what it. The new living says she's driving me crazy because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. The NIV says, I will see that she gets justice so she won't eventually come and attack me. Pretty similar takes. But what I like is the original Greek version. Because I think it says it best. I don't know why we need to stick with this. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will hit me under the eye. Mm. 
I don't know why we changed that, because that's what he's saying. This lady is going to just punch me in the face if I don't give her the justice she needs. We have to remember here, this isn't like a literal story. This isn't like we're reflecting back on this historical moment with a judge named XYZ and a widow named XYZ. This is a parable Jesus is using. So why this story of an unjust judge? And the obvious answer is because he's going to make a contrast here. He's going to show this is what an unjust judge looks like. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about your God. And he doesn't care about people. But, you know, who does? The just judge. The righteous judge. Amen. This contrasts this judge against our God and the way that our God acts. The way this judge acts and the way that God acts. Sometimes this is called the parable of the persistent widow. Sometimes it's called the unjust judge. But whatever you call it, in Luke 18, Jesus is setting up the story to show God's goodness, the goodness of our Father, the just judge. In Romans 1, 16 and 17, we see this really foundational idea about righteousness. The righteousness of God is a phrase that Paul uses several times in there. And then this classic verse that you think of when you think of Romans, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, where it's the power of of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and to the Greek. And then we see more of what this gospel, this good news is, for in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, and as, writ as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. So, God, as the righteous judge, as opposed to this judge, the very heart of his righteousness is revealed through the gospel. And it makes us ask them, what is the righteousness of God? Because this word righteousness is an interesting word. And these theologians who pour over this stuff, they have kind of three basic definitions of what righteousness is when it comes to God's righteousness. Some say it's an attribute of God. We know what attributes are. We know God loves us. We know that he is love. He is holy. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is everywhere. These are his attributes. And so one of those attributes is that he is righteous, just who he is by his nature. But more than just the attribute of God, his righteousness is a status that he gives us. Mm -hmm. and the same thing we've been reading through that in Romans in our Bible study. Mm -hmm. God makes us righteous when we believe in faith with all of our heart that Jesus died and rose from the dead. And then we confess that with our mouths. We believe in faith that that's true. We're guilty sinners, and God makes us righteous, right? Amen. It's nothing we do on our own. And this idea of righteousness, just like in this parable, comes from a courtroom scene. It comes from being made not guilty, being made innocent. We're guilty, and God stands in the gap as the righteous judge and makes us innocent. Again, nothing we do on our own, mm -hmm. except confessing that we're guilty. Admitting that we're guilty, realizing that Jesus rose from the dead and came to change the whole world. God alone makes us righteous. So, we've talked about this is an attribute of God, He is righteous. We've talked about this status that God makes us righteous. The third thing here to think about the righteousness of God is an activity of God. God actively intervenes on our behalf. It's awesome, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He intervenes on our behalf. He makes us right when we're sinners. He shows us mercy. He acts righteously. I'm going to read from God's word a little bit from Psalms. I hope that the proclamation of the word just blesses us here. This is so good. Psalm 18. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and his statutes I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from my guilt. So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands and his sight. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you show yourself pure. With the crooked, you make yourself shrewd. For you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. 
For it is you who light my lamp. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against the troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who equipped me with strength and made my way blindness. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. The God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who rescued me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from the man of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. And then one last little passage. This is so good. Psalm 7, verse 6. Arise, O Lord, in anger. Stand up against the fury of my enemies. Wake up, my God, and bring justice. Scatter the nations before you. Rule over them from on high. The Lord judges the nations. Declare me righteous, O Lord, for I am innocent, almost high. End the evil of those who are wicked and defend the righteous. For you look deep within the mind and heart, O righteous God. God is my shield, saving those whose hearts are true and right. God is an honest judge. He is angry with the wicked every day. <clears throat> so why do I read all that other than I just think the proper no! God's words awesome? I read all that because God acts in righteousness. It's what he does. So to recap, we talked about God is righteous as an attribute. And he declares us to be righteous as a status of who we are. We're saved by his grace. We're made righteous. We're justified. And then third, he acts in righteousness on our behalf, intervening in the lives of his people every single day in a million little ways. So there's a couple of themes here as we go through Luke 18. Because I think we really miss the whole point if we just see this as this parable about a widow and a judge, it's kind of abstract. We're thinking, okay, this is a nice story. Well, we can't lose sight of the very first sentence of this. Why did Jesus bring this up at all? Why does he talk about this parable in the first place? He's walking around with his disciples, and he stops and just tells them this out of nowhere. Hey, there's a parable about this judge. But he starts out by saying, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should, and just underline this, always pray and never give up. Okay. That's the point of this whole parable. Yeah, it's a good story about a judge and a widow who's helpless, and she doesn't uh, get her way, doesn't get justice. The whole point of this is always pray and never give up. The whole point of this is about prayer. We've been talking about this a lot. Mr. Payne, Pastor Terry, prayer, prayer, prayer. And I think when we come to a new year, it comes into our mind to pray a little bit stronger. Pray a little bit more often. Read your Bible a little bit more, right? It's not just taking your medicine or eating your vegetables. It's just very essential to what it means to be a believer. And you find out that it's not something you do out of duty or obligation, but getting in that rhythm of praying consistently, persistently, you start to fall in love more and more with God because you're walking with Him more and more. And you're building relationship with God. Prayer matters, and God hears us when we call. But the point isn't just about prayer in general. It's about persistent prayer. We should always pray and never give up. And I think we all know what always means, so it's not just a matter of defining what the word always means. It's reckoning with that. It's owing up to it. Pray persistently. Pray always. What does always mean? It means a lot. It means regularly as a rhythm of your life, not just checking in with God when you're in trouble or when you need him, you think in your mind. Mm -hmm. All times, always, like the widow, persistently. So will God bring about justice? Look at verse 7. Even he, talking about the unjust judge, rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? God's listening to the pleas of the widow. And so likewise, it clearly says, God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him. And we can say by extension, that's us. We also can cry out to God when he listens to us. Mm -hmm. 
We don't have to dig deeply in our Bible. You could probably just turn every other page and see evidence about how people called out to God and he answered them. But we also can see that this judgment that the righteous judge gives is a two-edged sword. So when he vindicates people who are crying out, it means there's also justice being served to the people who are oppressing. God's justice is not just vindication, it's also punishment. So we can think of Sodom and Gomorrah. We can think about when the Israelites flee the Egyptians. We know that God, let me just ask it this way, will God always answer? Will he delay when we call out to him? What do you think? Think about it just for a minute. Does God delay? Let's just be real. Because it feels like he delays sometimes. Right? Does it seem like God's taking too long? Maybe I'm not praying it the right way, or maybe I should phrase this differently, or maybe I'm not being sincere enough, or maybe my posture's not right, or maybe I'm not praying enough times. Let's look at David's Psalm 7, 6 that I just read a minute ago, a couple of verses of it, because if you feel frustrated when you pray, you're not the only one. <laughs> David says, Arise, O Lord, in anger. You ever tell the Lord to get up? <laughs> I don't know that I have the confidence to do that. <laughs> Stand up against the fury of my enemies. Wake up, my God, and bring justice. That's evidence of a relationship with God. He's frustrated with God. He's being real with God. He's not pretending to be some fake thing, he's crying out to God. Whether that's reverent or not, that's, that's between David and God. It sounds like a real relationship. Listen to the rawness of Psalm 13. Oh Lord, how long will you forget me forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle and anguish in my soul with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? But then two verses later, Again, same thing. He's been real with God. How long? Are you forgetting me? I mean, are you going to wait forever on this? What's going on? Do you feel that way when you pray? I've got a lot of things I'm praying about right now. A lot of things I'm praying about. I know you do too. I've got people in my life that are hurting. I've got situations in my life I want God's help. Um, there's people I'm praying for and events and things. That's what we're all doing. And sometimes it feels like God is distant. But we have to be real. Yes, we can vent our frustrations with God. We can be real with Him. That's what you do in relationships. You're honest with people. And that's what you should do with your relationship with your father. God, I don't know where you are right now. I'm, I'm missing something. Because what David does, he's so raw. He's so real. As he's singing and praising, he's even reading psalm or songs a lot of them. And it's like, he's in that moment of being real with God. God reveals himself. And it turns around. Listen how that turns around. How long will my enemy have the upper hand? And then two verses later. But I trust in your unfailing love. Right. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. Amen. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. We have these moments when we remember what God has done in our lives. So when, yeah, we're being real with God. I don't know where you are right now. I feel alone right now. I don't know why you're not healing this person. I don't know why it's not on my timeline. But I know this. Mm -hmm. You answer prayer because yes. I've seen you answer prayer. Amen. I've seen you heal people. I've seen you heal me spiritually, physically. We have evidence. We sing about evidence. We have evidence of God's goodness, what he does in our lives. So we can get frustrated. We can get real. But in that moment of passion, we're praying out to God and we're crying out. We're saying, where are you? I don't know where you are right now. We can have confidence that he's brought us through before. And he will again. And I will sing your praises because of that. Amen. What you find is when you do that, you're working it out. And you're going, you know what, God? You've got, I don't have this. It's not for me to worry about. You've got this. Jesus is our example. Think about it. He quotes Psalm 22 when he's on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, right? That's all we see of his account when he's on the cross. But that song goes on to say, Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift my voice, but I find no relief. Mm. That's persistent. 
But this psalm, too, it turns around as God's goodness and his righteousness are revealed, his character, his attributes, what he does, how he acts is revealed. You are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted in you, and you rescued them. They cried out to you, and you, and they were saved. They trusted in you, and were never disgraced. And so likewise, Jesus, who's <clears throat> crying out in agony, conquered death, and rose again. How did that prayer work? How did that quoting psalms and digging deep and being real with his Father? We can look at that example and know that God has the victory <clears throat> on the other side of that struggle. So then what's the answer? Will God, the righteous judge, delay when we cry out to him? As the New Living says, is God just putting us off? Jesus answers his own question without the shadow of a doubt in verse 8 of Luke. I tell you, he will bring justice to them and then underscore this word quickly. God's got this. It's in his hands. It's in his time. Be persistent. Keep praying about it. Don't lose heart. Never give up. That's what this story is about with this widow. It's not about just justice and judges. It's about praying and never losing heart. That's how he starts the parable. I think about Damar Hamlin, who we've talked about in Bible study before. Buffalo Bills football player. And you think about how God intervenes on such a global stage that we just are forced to reckon with. Wow. Yeah. I was watching that game with Jen live, and I'm sure some of you were, and I've seen clips of it, but a seemingly normal football hit. He bounces up from it, and he falls down dead on the field. Not passed out, not knocked out. He is dead on a field in front of him. I don't know, 65,000 fans in a world that's watching. And in that moment, people didn't go, well, I wonder if the laws of uh, our government will allow us to say in Jesus' name, or I don't, I don't know if maybe we should like run this before, before the league and make sure this prayer is uh, not offensive to certain religions. People they dropped to their knees. Yes. In tears. Holding hands, grown men, taking God very seriously. And you can say there's technology and there's, you know, they had this machine and all this stuff, but this man is dead. And people stopped what they were doing and they prayed. And newscasters who are maybe risking their jobs are praying to God. And God answered the prayer. In front of a lot of people, in front of a world that's watching, in front of a world who wonders if your God is real, who wonders if your God answers prayer. So what a testimony. I, I don't know everything about Damar Hamlin. I'm going to go on with his life. But it's a testimony. It's prayer, consistent prayer, corporate prayer, people who don't know each other, strangers praying, going to the hospital praying. It's just love. That's love. That's what this life is about. That's what the Christian life is about. It's about, I don't care what the world thinks. I'm going to drop to my knees right here because I'm desperate. I also think about Daniel when I think of persistent prayer. <clears throat> Daniel prays three times a day. He's in a rhythm. He gets on his knees and bows. He faces Jerusalem just out of reverence. He's got this rhythm to how he prays in his life, so much so that when they come to find him, they know where he's going to be because he's going to be praying. And it makes me think, is that how I am? If someone said, hey, I wonder if Nate's at home right now, you would know because that's my prayer time? That's convicting. Am I praying in a rhythm like that, that the world knows that I'm praying like that? Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice Always pray with, without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ in you. Always praying. Consistently giving thanks. That's also part of prayer. We've got our laundry lists and people that need healed. That's all real. There's nothing wrong with knocking on the door and bothering God, so to speak. It's like this woman's coming at the judge. Ask God all the time with your list, with your things that you're worried about. Cast your cares on the Lord. 
but also thank the Lord in prayer. That's right. Lord, I remember how you brought me through. I saw what you did to Damar and I know what you've done in my family's life. I know how you provide and put food on my table and take care of me when I don't deserve it. Thank the Lord all the time in prayer. Well, let's look at how this parable ends. And I'm going to kind of wrap it up here. Verse 8, this is this good, this is challenging. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? So, God the Father, unlike this judge, is the righteous judge, right? We've covered that, that ground today. What about Jesus? Where does he fit in this parable? He's not the angry guy. He's not the one that lays down the law, is he? He's not the one that ever gets mad at people, is he? Jesus, God's the judge, right? That's, I think most Christians would say that, God's the judge. Jesus is like good cop, bad cop. He's the one that loves everybody, and God's the, the hammer. Let's let the Bible answer this for us, because I'm just setting you up. In John 5, Jesus, he's driving these Jewish leaders crazy, because he's calling himself the Son of God, and they're just, they're losing their minds. And he's proving that he's the Son of God. He's doing all these miracles, and they just can't keep up with him. They're having to reckon with who Jesus is, and then listen to Jesus' words. For just as the Father gives life to those he raises from the dead, so the Son gives life to anyone he wants. In addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son absolute authority to judge, so that everyone will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who have sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. Now get this right here, John 5, verse 25. And I assure you that the time is coming, indeed it's here and now, when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God. He's talking about the end of days here. And those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself, and he has granted that same life-giving power to his Son. And he has given him authority to judge everyone because he is the Son of Man. Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. So I ask you, is Jesus the judge? Sounds like it to me. Sounds like it's a good thing to me. That the evil people are punished. The evil itself is punished. And that the oppressed, the widow, the helpless, they're vindicated. And then, just like what we read in this parable about the Son of Man's coming, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? In Revelation, we read about the same exact thing, the promised return of the Son of Man at the end of time. There's a scene of this judgment throne. The great and the small stand before the Lord. Judged according to what they've done and what they also have not done. So you tell me, God's the judge? Obviously, yes. Jesus is the judge? Without a doubt. So Jesus tells this parable to teach his disciples, and then, of course, us, because we get the blessing of having this word. We know this is for us. This word is for us. It's timeless. Pray at all times. Do not lose heart. We're supposed to unceasingly pray for God's justice and to remember and celebrate when he answers our prayer, to trust in the unfailing love of the righteous judge in contrast to the unrighteous judge. When Jesus returns, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith in you? Will he find that you're praying incessantly? We find that you're praying without stopping, that you've got a rhythm to your life, that you're known by the people around you as someone who prays, that they know, I better not call now because I know they're in church. 
I better not call now because I know they're praying to the Lord. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in you? Will he find faith in his church as a body? People know that this is a body that prays so long, that prays incessantly, that cares about each other and knows that God answers prayer. Will he find this body of faith not losing heart, a community of faith believing in righteousness and then proving it by trusting in the Lord together? No. With not just what we say, and we all agree on these things, but on what we do with our lives, no matter not in these pews. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? Let's pray. Lord, you are the just judge. Lord, we thank you for all that you do in our lives that your word says to never stop praying, to never stop asking you for things. And that's what we're doing, Lord, with our lives. Pray that you would encourage all of us to be in a rhythm of prayer, a rhythm of relationship with you, where we seek what you want, that we don't lose heart in what seems like a chaotic world, that we pray to you all the time, connected to you, that we know what your will is, Lord, because we're so connected to you. I pray for everyone here that their prayer life will be strengthened that they'd be encouraged, that they'd know that if they didn't have their time with you, that something was missing that day. Lord, I pray that you would make us feel that way. We love you so much. We're thankful for all that you do and who you are. In your name, amen. 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 I'm mm-hmm.